I always appreciate this time to come in and share with you some of the things that we've got going on, some of the things that we have done this year. And I want to start with Carolina's Healthcare System and UNC. Yes. What does that mean? Well, Carolina's Healthcare and UNC announced a plan to come together and to form a joint operating company. Now, this is exciting because when this happens, CHS and UNC will cover the entire state of North Carolina and over 70% of the residents of North Carolina will be within 20 minutes of a CHS or a UNC facility. Carolina's healthcare system brings to the table with this joint operating company their expertise in running regional facilities. UNC brings to the table, along with history of a great basketball team, um, their expertise in academics and research. So the fact that they want to come together and improve the health care across our state is phenomenal. They'll have three primary focus when they start out. The first is access to care in the rural health care system. That's us. The second is how do we improve behavioral health care. We deal with it every day. And the third is how do we improve access for Medicaid and uninsured patients. And we deal with that every day. So I'm excited that their three priorities are things that directly impact the care that we provide every single day. <clears throat> we don't know what it's going to look like as they come together, other than it will be a joint <coughs> operating company, there will not be a merger of assets. Mr. Gene Woods, who's the CEO of Carolina's Healthcare System, will be the CEO of the new company. And Dr. Bill Roper, who is the head of UNC Healthcare, will be the executive chairman of the new company. Their goal is to have the company up and operational by summer 2018. However, they got to have it approved by the Federal Trade Commission, the UNC Board of Governors, the North Carolina Legislature, and the Attorney General. But they are optimistic, and I'm right there with them, that they'll make it happen by summer. What does it mean for us right here in Burke County? The honest and simple answer is we don't know. They're looking right now at the overall big 30,000 foot level of what it means across the state of North Carolina. They have not yet looked at individual facilities and what type of impact they'll see there. So more to come on that, but it is exciting to think that some of the two of the largest healthcare systems in our state are coming together with shared goals and similar cultures. Examples of a few accomplishments we've had in 2017. We're doing the 5210 program in the Burke County Public Schools. How many of you know what 5210 is? <laughs> All right. We're wanting those students to eat five servings of fruit and vegetables a day, to have no more than two hours of computer time a day or screen time, one hour of physical activity, and zero sugary drinks. Now those are easy goals for children to understand. And think about how much healthier our children would be if we could get them to comply with that. So far it's been well received in the schools. Uh, Brett Pearson with our wellness group is heading up this charge and is having a ball with the students. So the schools are excited about this. We <coughs> offered to do it in a couple of schools starting out. And they came back and said, oh no, we want it done in all of them. So we said, we can do it. Blue Ridge Cardiology. This year, we changed from Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute to Blue Ridge Cardiology, an affiliate of Sanger Heart and Vascular. A lot of reasons for that. One is Dr. Mark Hazen, who is a Sanger physician, retired. That left Dr. Fernando de la Serna by himself. So we knew we needed to do some recruitment. About the same time, we were approached by Dr. Steve Isserman of Hickory Cardiology and Dr. Ryan Miller of Hickory Cardiology who said, you know, we would really like to be a part of Blue Ridge. We knew we needed the extra cardiologist, 
So we worked out a method to bring them all together, put them in one practice for some contractual legal reasons. We had to change the name, but it is Blue Ridge Cardiology, an affiliate of Sanger Heart and Vascular. Dr. Isserman, Dr. De Lucerna, Dr. Miller, and then Janice Makeupson, and Philip Deneen, and then Andrew Ross out of Marion, sat across the table from each other and said, how are we going to differentiate cardiology so that we provide better care than any other cardiology practice? And how do we let people know that? <clears throat> That's what they came up with. They want to make sure that their goal is same day, next day, appointments. So if your primary care doctor needs to refer you to a cardiologist, their goal is that they will see you that same day or the next day. Because they said if you have an issue with your heart, you don't want to hear that you're going to have an appointment in three weeks. You want to have it taken care of. So that is their goal. They're committed to that. They're excited about it. And we have seen patient volumes in cardiology skyrocket just within the last couple of months. So I think this is turning out to be a very good thing for Blood Bridge. Women's Health Group. We have added two female OBGYN providers, Dr. Spricky and Dr. McClure. And what we're also doing at the Morganton practice is we are adding a Medi Spa. So we'll be offering things at that practice like Botox, the vein work, you know, those things that make you look good and feel good. But we're doing it within the provider's practice so that we have provider oversight. So that's coming. That started a little bit of that in 17 by getting the two female providers on board. You'll see more about the May Spa coming out in 2018. We started eBus, endobrachial ultrasound. This is a screening process for lung cancer. It's an early screening that allows us to detect lung cancer much quicker. Because normally, when lung cancer is found and diagnosed, it's stage four. With eBus, we can catch it much more quickly, which then allows a much higher rate of recovery for the patient. So we're excited about this. It's taken off. It's doing very well. And I think we're the only one yes, around here <clears throat> that does that. Thursday night, our Lights of Love. We're doing it differently this year. It'll all be over at the Valdez campus. Dr. Derek Ragavon, who is the president of Levine Cancer Institute at Carolina's Healthcare System, will be one of our speakers. So please come out and join us for Lights of Love, and then take a tour of Levine Cancer Institute at Blue Ridge. A lot of people have not seen our cancer center, and once you see it, people are very impressed with how nice it is and how warm and welcoming. Other thing to point out on the other side is we have a program called Informed, which is hosted by, what's his name? Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe, thank you. Um, that came and filmed here the story of our Athlete at Heart program, where we have saved the lives of three young men who are back playing sports today. <clears throat> With the issues that were found, they could have had sudden death on the field or on the court. We found it ahead of time. They had heart surgery, and now they're okay. So that program will air probably after the first of the year on PBS. It will be seen across the nation. And we're not doing that to really promote our Athlete at Heart program because it's really for the, the local students. But we're doing it to say to people across the nation, if you do student physicals, make sure you include all components, especially the cardiac component, because that's where we've saved the lives of these young men. Calendars, I don't know if you've seen your calendar yet, but they're ready, they're here. So make sure you, you pick up a calendar. It also covers our community benefits. So in the front cover, you can see the things that we've done and accomplished and given back to our community. Master Facility Plan. This has been a year timeline. 
It took us a year to put together the master facility plan for our system. The board approved it at their October meeting. We started with a whole lot of information and a whole lot of convoluted ideas and thoughts. So we kind of came out like that. And as we worked through the timeline, it started making sense and we started pulling out of it what needed to happen and what was going to be the best thing for our system. When we looked at it, we looked at our Morganton campus. We wanted to make sure that we could leverage the existing assets that we had, that we were set up for future of acute care, and that any investment we made was a precision investment that was going to have a yield. Valdez campus, we transformed it into ambulatory in 2014. We transitioned all inpatients to this campus. We needed to do some cost reduction. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we felt very strongly that the Valdez campus was an offensive and a defensive hub for us. It allowed us to provide services on the eastern part of the county and also to pull in from that side of Catawba and Caldwell. Ambulatory, we wanted to make sure that we were leveraging our economies of scale, that we were pulling together everything that was appropriate to pull together for ambulatory. And then long-term care, we actually looked at do we stay in the long-term care business? And made the decision that, yeah, we needed to do that. What we recommended and what the board approved on the Valdez campus, we will construct a facility replacement. What that means is that we will build a new building that will house our Levine Cancer Institute, either emergency or urgent care. We're still um, working out the data for that. Imaging, rehab, outpatient surgery, lab, pharmacy. Pain and wound will move to the Valdez Medical Office building. And then we talked about urgent care or the freestanding ED. That's a 60 some million dollar investment on that campus. Once that building is constructed and operational, we will tear down the old Valdez Hospital. A lot went into that. Um, I'll talk about it as I get to the Valdez portion so that you kind of understand why we made that decision. Grace Ridge, strategically, we're going to continue the upgrades that we've started over there. So in 2018, we should start the construction of their new kitchen, the addition of a bistro, and the upfits to floors three, four, and five. And then in Morganton, we felt like we need to focus on a new acute care pavilion that predominantly houses ED and ICU, and that we need to look at, as we construct a new facility on Valdez and construct a new pavilion here, do we move some of those licensed beds from Valdez to this campus? So, let's start with Valdez. We looked at, can we just demo the old part of the hospital and leave surgery, cancer, and ED where they are? And yes, we could do that, but we would have to close cancer, surgery, and ED for four to six months while we demoed the building. Well, we can't do that. We looked at, do we just leave it as it is? Or do we do cancer renovations adjacent to the building? Or do we just build a new facility? When we looked at all of that, what we came up with was at a 20-year timeline, it was cheaper to build a new building and demo the old building than it would be to do any of the other options. Now, we're going to spend more up front to build a new building but to keep the old facility and to keep it maintained with the HVAC and the old plumbing and all of that ends up costing us more in the long run than it does to take it down and build a new one. So that's our plan. This is where the current hospital is. This is the walking track. That's where we plan to build the new facility. We take down the old one. We've still got the medical office building over here. And then we'll have green space in the middle with hopefully some areas that the community can utilize. 
just a rendering of what it might look like. <coughs> Please don't, when it's built, say that's not the picture she showed. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the, ar the architect saying this is just a concept of what it might look like. Probably be two stories. We'll have entrances on both sides for the different services. But this building will be designed and constructed for ambulatory patients. Right now, we're trying to provide care in a hospital that was built for inpatient stays. And it's very difficult for efficiency and for getting patients in and out. So this will make it much better for our patients going forward. When we look at the Morganton campus, this is the area that we're interested in seeing expand. This is the side of the new ORs. And it's also where the old POV currently sits. So the old POV would have to come down and we would build a new pavilion beside the expanded ORs. We would put a new emergency department there. We would put new ICU and we would put a new lab. And then we would have expansion capability vertically and horizontally as healthcare continues to change. <coughs> Again, just a rendering of kind of where it might and how it might tie in. So that as our med surge beds continue to age, then we have options for building new facilities on that side of the campus. This puts emergency department, ICU, and surgery right there together. And our most critical patients actually are moving between those departments. And then long-term care, we're gonna do some aesthetic upgrades to College Pines and to Grace Heights. And I've already told you about the strategic upgrades to Grace Ridge. So we're gonna put some money into long-term care facilities. Our architects, um, engineers looked at our facilities and said we can do mechanical improvements, we can do aesthetic upgrades, and they'll actually operate almost like new buildings. So we're excited about seeing that work start. So when it all is said and done, the plan is 21 million for routine capital. That's paint, flooring, the things that you do just to keep a place looking fresh. It's 13 million for FCA facility condition assessment priorities. That's your mechanical and your structural. And it's 161.5 million for the strategic improvements. So all in, it's a 195.5 million dollar plan. Please hear me stress the word plan. What we've done is develop a plan that will take us through 10 years. But as with any plan, it will change. Healthcare delivery models continue to evolve and change. Reimbursement models change. So as things like that happen, this plan will change. And our board is very comfortable knowing that we will have in-flight adjustments as we go through this plan. So 10 years from now, don't tap me on the shoulder and say, well, that's not what you said. Yeah. Because we know that it will change. We don't know how it's going to change. It may be a small change, it may be major changes. But please understand that we start with what we know today and the assumptions and what the futurists have said, but things will change as that plan evolves. Again, 195.5 million. Starting out, we'll do the Valdez campus and we'll start with long-term care. The Morgan <coughs> campus will not start until 2024. We take a little bit of a breather in 2023, kind of take a deep breath, and then get back to just spending a lot of money again. We'll work with our foundation to see if they're willing to take on some type of capital campaign, and then we'll fund it through our investment income, through our operations, and then through our investments. And probably we'll go to the bond market also. So what the board has approved is a plan to spend $195 million. We will go back to the board for every component for approval before we actually start each component. And then I want to end with, kiss the season. You all remember the star that the wise men followed to get to what drove them and set the stage for us and our beliefs today. What we follow at Blue Ridge is what we call the true north. 
the true north in clinical terms is giving the value to the patient. But what it really means is what you were talking about when I walked in the room. The smile that the visitor needs, the pat on the hand of the patient that's scared, riding in an elevator with somebody who's scared of elevators, explaining to a patient this is what's going to happen, being the voice that gets us moving in the right direction when people need help. That's our true north because that's what gives value to what we do, what you do, and what our patients need. We couldn't do what is needed in this community without you. So please understand that we appreciate and recognize the almost 18,000 hours that you put into this organization every year. It makes a huge difference in what happens within our walls, but it makes an even bigger difference in the perception of the community. You represent the community. And I want the community to feel like we are their provider of choice. And by what you bring to us and then what you share with the people that are your friends and neighbors, you're helping position us as the provider of choice and the one that can provide what is needed by the people who come to us in pain, sick, scared, very anxious. These people put their trust in what we do, and they put their very lives in our hands. And everybody that encounters them makes a huge difference in their perception and how they feel. Because they don't go home and tell the people in their home, in their Sunday school class, in their community, how impressed they were with the facility and the technology. They go home and talk about how all of us made them feel and you contribute heavily to that and make a huge difference. So at this time of year, just let us say thank you for the joy that you bring, not only to our lives, but to the people that we touch every single day. We appreciate it.